and to the listeners this evening. We welcome the speakers today, Professor Christopher Mbazia and, um, and Aaron Chiza. And yeah, we are discussing um, the state of the judiciary in Uganda. Um, yeah, I think we are good to start. I would like to know if you can hear me, Goodwin, and the rest. You, you're loud and clear, I think you can start. Am I too loud, like you? <laughs> I don't want people to reduce <laughs> reducing the volume. You're, you're loud enough. That's that's all I can say. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let, let's get started. Um, good evening once again. My name is Agatha Chaye, and um, I welcome you to this edition of Agora Discourse. We normally have them every week or twice a week to discuss issues that are, you know, affecting the country and to see the way forward. Today, we would like to discuss um, uh, our judiciary. The judiciary has been, uh, I think, in turmoil for a while now, in the recent past, um, worse, because we, we, we are remembering so many things, like um, the, the letter of the president to the chief justice recently, um, talking about um, the decision in a case that was involving the Muslim properties and um, expressing his uh, displeasure with how how that decision was reached out or the decision that was reached out. We are also talking about, you know, I don't know if it was by coincidence or not, the the judicial officer in that case later being dropped from, um, I mean, was not confirmed among the acting judicial officers. And there was a case challenging the acting nature of judicial officers. Um, we saw the peaceful demonstrators in the walked parliament and how um, they were kept in detention for, for a while. One is still there, actually. We were, we, we've been talking about him today and, and what transpired at court today, which I will get into later. And, and all that um, has made many people question the independence of, of the judiciary and, and its state in general. But um, to, you know, get into the details of, of what we are going to discuss today is um, there was a performance report uh, recently that was um, that was talked about by the Chief Justice Owinidoro, and he seemed um, content with the performance of the judiciary, um, talked about the increase in the budget, um, in the time he's been Chief Justice, talked about um, the case backlog and, and how it has reduced in the year that he has been, in this year that he, that was under review, 2023, 2024. Um, yeah, so we, we would like to discuss if that satisfaction is reflected in the rest of the members of the public and, and way forward. I welcome our panelists today. Professor Christopher Mbazira, the former principal of law school in Makere University. Professor, you're most welcome to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Agatha. And thank you, Agora, for organizing this. Yeah, I also would like to welcome Aaron Chiza, the human rights lawyer. And uh, Yes, you're welcome, Aaron. My pleasure to join you this evening for this very important discussion. I'm looking forward to a fulfilling uh, discourse. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to start off by saying that we always want to have a balanced panel to hear from the other side because we have some of the questions that would have loved that the person responding to them is from the judiciary, but um, the spokesperson told me he's unwell and on leave and uh, did not seem to, to find another person to replace him on this panel. I also would like to say I have seen some people ask why we never uh, have women panelists, like really, but I always want that so bad. I, I, I look for them, but I I'm not, I'm really successful, but we'll keep trying. So let's start. I'm going to start with Professor Christopher. I, I'd like to, like, generally, uh, for, for you to start us off uh, as a teacher of the law, uh, and, you know, they say you guys teach the theory. I would like mm -hmm. for you to, to, to take us through um, what you think of the theory that we learn, mm -hmm. that you teach us, vis-a-vis -vis the practical of what's happening in, in our judiciary. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Agatha. First of all, I want to demystify the perception that uh, teachers of law are teachers of theory. That's not the case anymore, because uh, some of us, and indeed increasingly, a substantial number of law teachers teach the law, but they also practice the law, either as commercial legal practitioners or key actors in civil society, advisors, and, uh, and, uh, and the rest. So it's no longer true that uh, university teachers and professors are theoretical. Uh, to the contrary, they engage in a lot of uh, practical work, just, just, as, uh, just as I do. Um, of course, theory is important as well. We cannot uh, dismiss theory because sometimes, again, people dismiss theory. But we need to understand that theory is important because theory is what helps us to not only construct, but also determine the appropriateness of uh, the doctrines that we apply in the, in the law. So when we speak of uh, doctrines like independence of the judiciary, we must know that, you know, it has a theory behind it. It was theorized based on the practical challenge the society was facing at the time, and then it was put into, into, into practice. 
But uh, where I want to start, Agatha, my listeners, uh, first of all, I'm happy to be part of this panel because I'm at the tail end of uh, a book that I'm writing. Hopefully, we should have the book before the end of next year. And the book is looking at uh, the role of the judiciary in constitutional uh, transformation. So uh, I'll draw on some of the uh, findings I've made in my research, but also from what I've deduced uh, reading, uh, reading the report on the judicial, on judicial performance uh, in Uganda. Uh, in terms of uh, the theory, without going into details now, uh, first of all, I want to say that you cannot assess the performance of the country's judiciary without understanding the political context within which the judiciary works. And you cannot understand the judicial context without understanding the political regime type that you have. Because different regime types uh, build judiciaries differently. Different judicial, I mean, uh, political regime types uh, use the judiciary differently depending on the objectives and agendas of, uh, of uh, that particular political regime. So it is important to understand the regime type. In our case, I just want to understand the regime type that we have in, uh, in Uganda. Uh, secondly, you cannot understand the performance of your judiciary without uh, alluding to the performance of other institutions that support the judiciary. Because the performance of the judiciary is facilitated by uh, the performance of such other justice uh, or legal institutions such as the police, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, Uganda Prisons and, uh, and others that support, as well as the legal profession. The legal profession is also is also key. So you need to understand uh, how those uh, other institutions are performing and how they contribute to the performance of uh, performance of the judiciary. Um, then probably the last uh, uh, theoretical thing, uh, probably not a theory as such, but maybe uh, a line that I want to draw is that you need to also understand, and it could be a theory, yes, you need to also understand that uh, the performance of the judiciary, as much as it is uh, de determined to a certain extent by the performance of the other institutions, the performance of the judiciary has a ripple effect on a number of, uh, on a number of things. It has a ripple effect on the rule of law, the ripple effect on the levels of democracy, it has a ripple effect on the state of human rights, it has a ripple effect on conflict and violence in the in a particular country. It also in business terms it actually has a ripple effect on the efficiency on efficiency in a, in a, in business and, and by necessary implication the efficiency of the economy or the performance of uh, the performance of the economy. So one could actually draw parallels between uh, judicial performance and uh, economic uh, economic indicators. So uh, by way of introduction, Agatha, that's what I can say. Thank you. Um, I, I, I like I like that you've drawn us to uh, these other aspects that we need to pay attention to. Um, and um, I wanted to ask that that you still first tell us in your view, um, looking at these other factors, how are we faring? How is our judiciary in this country uh, faring? If I can stay with you for just a moment. Okay, sure. Let me start with uh, what I said that we cannot understand. Uh, the country's judiciary without understanding the political, the political context and the regime type. And maybe what I did mention is that we can also not understand the performance of the judiciary unless we understand the history of, uh, and not just the judiciary, any institution. You cannot understand its performance unless you understand its, uh, its history. So we need to go back a bit in time to trace the judiciary, how it has, uh, it has evolved. Um, one of the things that comes out, of course, the former judiciary as we know it today is a construction of the colonial state, uh, 1980, 1894, 1898, and then 1902, or then council where we see the formal judicial institution being established. This is not to say that we didn't have judicial power-like structures in society. We did, but I will not go there. Now, when you look at the colonial state and how it established the judiciary, first of all, from the start, it was never the intention of the colonial state to have an independent judiciary in terms of independence from the executive and uh, independence from the legislative process. The judiciary was established uh, to a certain extent as an extension of the executive. And it was established as an instrument to be used by the colonial state to further its agenda, which was uh, subjugation, which was economic exploitation, which was extending its tentacles by, uh, you know, increasing its reach in terms of uh, territory. So the judiciary came in, uh, came, in, uh, came in handy. And of course, it had to be backed by laws that the judiciary would then uh, enforce. And then we see the important laws, when you look at our criminal laws, for instance, the British didn't think it wise to bring the criminal law as it obtained in England. Instead, they brought the criminal law they had uh, drafted or designed for other colonies, including uh, including India. So then the judiciary starts to evolve, and slowly, of course, we begin to see some form of independence of the judiciary, but in a tokenist manner, in the sense that uh, whenever the uh, executive thought, you know, we should uh, make the judiciary appear independent, then they would do so. 
uh, eventually the High Court was um, established, but the appointment processes were still very much out of sync with uh, what a, a judicial, an independent judiciary would be, and then it evolved uh, like that. Now, when we get independence in 1962, naturally, all decisions of the state were supposed to be at the forefront of transformation. So meaning the judiciary had to position itself as a transformative institution or as a tool of transforming society, taking us from the evils of the colonial state that were characterized by violation of human rights, exploitation, subjugation, and things like that, to another place where, you know, there's democracy, there's human rights, there is a uh, self-determination, uh, etc., etc. That's what one would have expected the judiciary to, to play. But, but unfortunately, since gaining independence, we've uh, seen so many challenges that have uh, that indicate, or we've seen a situation where one could say the judiciary has not fully played its role in transformative uh, in transformative uh, terms. To step back in history again, uh, every student of uh, judicial performance in Uganda must be alive to the events of 1966 during the. 1966 crisis and then the legal questions that arose and how the judiciary responded to, to those questions. For instance, one of the biggest questions that arose in, in two cases, even in and Expate Matovu, was whether an unconstitutional change of government, including abrogation through abrogation of the constitution, would be upheld as legal and, and, and valid. And that was the first time we see the judiciary being tested post independence to see how it was going to perform in transformative terms. Uh, many of us uh, listening here may know how the, the courts decided, but uh, for those who may not, in summary, the court decided that uh, it was okay to use unconstitutional means to change government or to change the legal order as long as you establish a new legal order that is effective and uh, whoever is in charge is able to run that legal 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 order. And unfortunately, we, we've not recovered from uh, recovered from, uh, from, from from that. So we didn't see the judiciary uh, almost disappearing in the time of Idi Amin. We see uh, the abduction and uh, assassination of the Chief Justice Benedicto Chiwanuka happening. We see the era of uh, military tribunals where, you know, justice was administered by uh, uh, by military men enforcing such laws as economic uh, uh, economic sabotage decree whereby people could be executed on, on site if they were found to be committing economic crimes like economic sabotage uh, or selling outside the control prices and, uh, and, things, and things like that. And there are various uh, various examples. So one needs to see historically how the judiciary has performed in transformative terms, and for me that's what I'm most uh, interested in, and uh, bring us up to speed in terms of uh, in comparative, comparative terms. How are we doing uh, right uh, right now? Now, before I continue this, let me just go back, because I went through the report and I was trying to understand the indicators that the report uses to determine the performance of uh, performance of the judiciary. Now, again, theoretically, if I can go back to the theory, if we have to understand uh, uh, the extent of performance of the judiciary, we must look to like six or seven things. One is the question of independence and impartiality. Of course, the report doesn't. The report alludes to the independence of the judiciary, and indeed it uh, refers to the provisions of the Constitution. Um, we must uh, look at the timeliness of proceedings. Again, the report alludes to, alludes to that. We must look at the uh, uh, treatment of parties, which uh, goes to satisfaction of court users. We must look at uh, the question of accessibility of courts. And um, those are the standard indicators that uh, one finds in uh, various judicial reviews. But, but for me, to that I add an extra indicator, which to me is the transformative uh, performance of, uh, of the judiciary, how transformative has, uh, has the judiciary been. And for me, the indicators here include, uh, probably one broad indicator includes whether the judiciary has been able as an actor to move society from one place to another. So where, where has society been previously? And where do we want to go and how has the judiciary helped us? So when you look at the history, the judiciary has largely failed us. Of course, there are exceptions here and there, but the judiciary in Uganda since 1962 has largely failed us in that transformative, uh, in that transformative, uh, role. There are very good decisions, uh, that are to a certain extent transformative. There are decisions that, uh, change certain things, but generally when it comes especially to the biggest challenge that we have, which is uh, building a, a full liberal democracy. That's, that's something that has not worked uh, very well. I want to conclude this point then by uh, uh, elaborating what I said uh, regarding the regime type. I said that uh, for you to understand how the judiciary is performed, you also need to understand the political context and the regime uh, type. Now, uh, on the spectrum of uh, political regimes, I'm not a political scientist, but I've been able to read here and there and uh, try to understand the regime types. They are quite various, and different terms are used by political scientists to describe the regime, the regime types. But uh, what I can say 
is that uh, on the spectrum of regime types, you have dictatorships on one side, and then you have liberal democracy, democracies on the other side, which is the ideal. So in the current political context, according to political scientists, the ideal is to have a liberal, a liberal democracy, a liberal democracy that uh, adheres to rule of law, that has a full, uh, that has uh, that where people are empowered to vote their leaders, where there are democratic institutions, where there is uh, adherence to standards of uh, human rights and the international instruments uh, and things like that. Then, of course, on the other side, the opposite side, you then have the dictatorships, where those that uh, disregard the rule of law, those that disregard human rights, those that concentrate power in a, a few people or one person, and uh, those that uh, disregard uh, legal institutions and, uh, and, and procedures and uh, do things in an, arbitrary, in an arbitrary manner. But on that spectrum, we keep having different points at which we have uh, different regime uh, types. Uh, and the one which fascinated me most was the hybrid regime, which on the face of it has tenets of uh, a democracy, a liberal democracy on the face of it. It has, uh, for instance, periodic elections. It has uh, uh, a judiciary that uh, is a guaranteed independence in terms of uh, the legal framework and all things that on the face of it make uh, a, a liberal democracy. But when you scratch the surface below that, you also see tenets of uh, despotism. You see uh, tenets that are inconsistent with a liberal democracy. And, and one of the things that uh, is always that, uh, that is prominent is control, where there is uh, control, where the political regime uh, tries as much as possible and uses all means to control all uh, control all the affairs of the state, control all institutions of the state, control lawmaking processes, control everything, and ultimately the purpose of the control, because all political regimes want to have control, but ultimately the purpose of the political the, uh, control is to uh, retain political power at whatever cost. So if the control requires that you disregard judicial independence, you do. If the control requires you at a particular point that you disregard human rights, you do. If the control requires that you disregard the tenets of a free and fair election, you do. So, and, and all institutions that they are uh, constituted or they are, uh, uh, what, what should I use? They are designed. They are designed in terms of their operations to ensure that that control, that control is, uh, is effective. So, Agatha, do I still make sense? Am I hard? Yes, yes, you are very hard. I have taken lots of things that I will follow up with you on. Okay. And let, let me, let me first bring in Aaron now. But thank you for that, um, elaborate background. So, Aaron, um, you are in these courts on a daily basis, um, and um, in that report that we are talking about, the Chief Justice uh, put the confidence of Ugandans in the courts at 71%, um, as per a report by last night. But there was a report before by Afrobarometer, which says that only 14% of Ugandans say they are very confident in our courts. And, um, and actually, I think the professor also alluded to it, um, the confidence of people in the judiciary. How do you rate your confidence in our judiciary at this moment? Uh, you can hear me? <coughs> I can. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So first, before I answer that one, let me start with the preliminary. I want to indicate that the refusal, call it the failure of the judicial mouthpiece to appear, is just the uh, microcosmic of the attitude of the judiciary towards public matters. Is there a, a human rights crisis in the judiciary that if one official is tired, sick, or simply just unserious, we cannot get another judicial member, member of the judiciary to come here and talk to the public? That's how you start by analyzing the judiciary. You don't get a, 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 <laughs> a paper, hmm? 190 pages, and you throw them on PDF and you think we can agree to judge the judiciary by that. No. You don't measure the judiciary like that. So I think he owes us an apology. Why do you fail to appear to the media? Why don't, don't you have an assistant? We have how many judicial officers? Any of them can speak for the judiciary. The people of Uganda need attention, care, respect, and dignity from the judiciary. They don't need this kind of detached attitude, insensitive attitude. So for me, that's where I start. But uh, your question was uh, on, uh, okay. on, on the data. The data from Raspinet is fake. Aaron, can you still hear? Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Agatha. Yeah. Do you hear me? Aaron, drop off. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Agatha, if you can't hear me. Okay. Is there anyone who is hearing me? Once done. And I hope the rest can hear him as well. Spire, could you please make a sign if you can hear him? Because I can hear him loud and clear. Yeah, sure. Chrissy, I can hear him loud and clear. Okay, 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 okay. My point was the data from Raspinet, and I am a member of Raspinet, what is an ally, is fake. It is fake. 
It is the barometer data that I would go with. There is a very low, 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 low trust in our judiciary. And the reason that it is low is that when even they try to make a report, they don't use the proper parameters that they should be using. You see, judiciary is, a, a, these are public servants. They offer a public good called the justice or access to justice. They are the custodians of rule of law. They are the guardians of the liberal democracy that a good professor was talking about. These are the one of the pillars of government, the third pillar of government. They are supposed to usher in into the kind of vision promised by the 1995 constitution, what he called the transformative uh, judiciary. So the real question is how do lawyers feel about the what? The judiciary. That's the how you will measure. How do ordinary people think feel about the judiciary, what do they make of it? If you go in a taxi, if you get a border border, what do they think of a judiciary? Those are the things. Had the, had the good chief justice bothered to ensure that that kind of criteria is used, they would have found that the trust is low and that the people are actually very suspicious of the judiciary. Even the legal fraternity is being guarded by the judiciary in that year in which you're saying that uh, people are very happy with the judiciary. No, 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 no. They are not. We are not happy. And that is why we, we give a resounding... Uh, protest vote in the we were not merely protesting about uh, on about uh, government no mainly the tables that must be banged are the judicial tables because these are our frontline warriors for justice or they are supposed to be but most of them have really have abdicated, abdicated that throne and they, they, they it needs they need to be the tables need to be banged so that those of them who are asleep again like the professor said they are good apples but they are not many they are few and before the judiciary is not, doesn't recruit itself, but once they are there, like the upper side the judicial officers, they are supposed to pretend that they are there on merit, that they are not military cadres, and actually accept that there is some merit in them. That's why they are in the, in the judiciary and act with, the, with such an impartiality, with such an independence. The other indicator of how the judiciary is performing, you have to see what is its contribution to rule of law. How fiercely is it defending, defending the rule of law? How fiercely are they defending judicial independence? How transparent are they? Are they a model or a mirror of good governance? Has the judiciary shed its colonial gadgets, its colonial regalia, its colonial roots, or they are still steep, dipped in it? Um, why is the Supreme Court delaying clarification on military injustice for civilians? That is a case that can be handled in two weeks by those judges. Sure. And the Supreme Court, it is, the, it is before them, and we have a situation in Uganda where you, people are, all the military needs for me to be convicted, or all the only people I'm seeing on the space, is just to pick me. They don't even need to throw a brick in my car. They could actually do that. I could go to the saloon, and I find that they have just seized my car, put whatever they want, and taken it to what? To much in there. And after four years, you can be very sure, even me, like Rutaya, I will say that, yes, I committed this crime. I also want liberty. Maybe after that, I may free or I may remain here. As now, you may see now me speaking tongues now as a dogmatic person, and you ask what has happened to Eric. But after four years of unnecessary detention, no trial, what do we expect of Ugandans? Of course, breed greater in order for them to go home. It is not new. It happened to PRA suspects. It happened to our clients in the Menzo region. And the reason it is easy is because the judiciary has not looked the military in the eye and told them that the ordinary Ugandans are not to be tried there in your military disciplinary committees called the courts martial that uh, you are not impartial that you are incapable of delivering a fair hearing in a case in a, in a, in a, in a court composed of people whom the president can ring, can write judgments for, are uh, waiting for Have we, have we lost Aaron? Yeah, I can't, I, I can't hear him. I thought I was the one who had a problem again. Okay, let me work to get him back. You can continue with Professor. I can't as well. Okay. Um, so, so Professor, one of the issues I wanted to come back to you about was um, where you, you talk about the ultimate goal being to retain power and if control requires, so to maintain control, even if it requires, you know, dispensing the rule of law and violating rights and, and whatever. And, and that seems to be the case in Uganda. When you listen to, when you see what has been happening, which is what Aaron was talking about just before um, uh, we lost him here, you know, the, the, the noob supporters that have been in the court martial for four years, and this is despite the constitutional court ruling, in the Kabaziguruka case that that uh, that 
found it illegal to try civilians in military courts. And the same Chief Justice that was talking about um, the performance of the judiciary as if it's uh, rosy is the one that gave a stay of execution for that um, order and has sat for that judgment and has sat on the on, on this appeal that is before him. And now we know that this is trying to maintain control, right? But what what can we do? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to sit and fold our hands? Is there any other um, baby body or, or, or entity that can rein in on the judiciary when things like this are happening? Is there any um, recourse that we can take? I got, as if we've lost Professor as well. Oh, uh, but but Aaron is back. Yeah, I, I've sent Aaron. I've sent you an invitation to speak. Let me let me work on getting Professor as well back. Um, yeah, sorry. Hmm. Sorry, these problems are always happening. But if um, yeah, we can. See if we can get Aaron back and, and then. Sam, have you sent Aaron an invite? Okay, um. Uh, uh, is, sorry? Let me, let me try to book him. Let me try to get him. He's not on the call yet. I Aaron see him is on the call, call though. I see Aaron, him. Aaron, perhaps, if you can hear me, uh, maybe uh, you just step off and then come back. That could be the, the solution. Um, I, I also told Professor that he's off. I don't know if he had noticed, but yeah. So Agatha, you could just hold on. Maybe you can take a question. Okay. I'll take a no, in, in the meantime, I can um, still be going through the, the contents of the report uh, in case some of the people on the call didn't um, didn't go through it. And and one of the things that the Professor was talking about are the indicators of um, you know performance of the judiciary that. Um, that the Chief Justice did not even say anything about. One of them, which is the most important, is the independence of the judiciary. As I was saying and, and asking the professor, we have seen this independence eroded on so many occasions. I think one that comes to mind um, just before the recent ones was the 2005 uh, raiding of, of the High Court by the Black Mamba. But so many other things have happened since then. For example, like we were saying, the, the trial of civilians in military courts, we have had um, the state minister for youth, yeah, for youth and, and, and I don't know, the ministries in this country are, are so many to keep up with the former promoter, but um, I don't know if he still does both um, cabinet job and, and, and promoting. He was saying that he's going to talk to, to the judges. And today we had one of the of the suspects, the protesters that is still in court, saying he called uh, a magistrate, magistrate before whom he's appearing, and said he should keep him in prison until um, the loop supporters are out of prison. And all those things speak to the the independence of the judiciary. How, what do we make of that? What can we do to make sure that we have an independent judiciary? But also, how do we? Um, tell the Chief Justice that the performance he's talking about is really not to the satisfaction of many Ugandans. I see Aaron is back. Aaron, we had lost you when you were still um, submitting. I don't know if you remember where you are at or if we can um, move yeah, to I the next be, point. I would be happy to be reminded who, <laughs> because I really rambled on until I realized that I was speaking to myself. I think that, you were you were talking about the, the fate of these NUP supporters and saying that it, it's not the first time this is happening. Okay. Um, I, 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 my point in summary is that the, no member of the judiciary should sleep. They should all be panicking. They should be acting in a like crisis mode. This is a case can be solved in two weeks, just two weeks. There is even no complexity. There is nothing. We need the Supreme Court to solve this madness of a military kangaroo court, pretend, military disciplinary kangaroo committee, pretending that they can do impartial justice, which they are structured by design incapable of doing. They are not, they, they cannot do it. The commander in chief can't allow them. They are appointed not to do that. So the Supreme Court needs to end these two cases that are before them. It was ma- pure madness from Chiriowa that he even uh, uh, applied for and got a state of execution against the good constitutional judgments that has, that agree with me that uh, there is no civilian justice to be got from military tribunals like the courts martial. And the judiciary cannot be failing to handle such a cases and they tell us that they are doing very well. No. You see, performance for judiciary is not something you can even reduce to statistics. It is a qualitative, it has to be also qualitatively assessed. That's why I was very keen and very clear on the issues of rule of law as the primary, primary, primary parameters on which to premise any assessment of the judiciary. But I want also to say that the economy, the judiciary has a, 
a contribution to make to the economy. And again, it goes back to how people feel, who go there, how are they treated, are they treated fairly, do people feel welcome in courts? If people are, if judiciary is jailing, and I was emphasizing that cases from original suit to, to the apex court can take 15 years, the lawyer will be tired, the client will be tired, everyone will be disappointed with each other, but mostly, and uh, unfortunately, the clients view us, they don't differentiate us from the judiciary. They will think lawyers are, are thieves, that the courts are whatever, because just after one year of litigation, for two years, people are tired, including the lawyer, but more so the client. Some clients even forget about the cases and just leave it to you for the lawyers. But the ones who are really following up and their ordinary clients, they will be short of money. And the lawyer at some point probably even doesn't have transport to go to court. Or the client might not have the transport to come to court themselves because even the clients have transport to implications and other financial implications. So timeliness is not there in our courts in terms of most of the judgments, except if it is a, a, a special case in which the first family has an interest. And then that one will be rushed. But these other cases tend to be slow. And we need cases of business, not taking more than a year. Is the reason which okay. case is, yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Professor, do we have you back? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I'm back. Sorry, okay. I think it's my internet. Yes, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's one of the problems we have to contend with in this, this country as well. So I, I had, I was asking a question before you dropped off and mm-hmm. it was from the point you make about, um, maintaining control. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was saying that Everything you say about maintaining control and if it requires you to dispense with the rule of law or, or, you know, ignore human rights and all that is what we are seeing happening in this country. But the question is, is there anything we can do? Is there any recourse? Is there any other entity we can look up to to rein in on the judiciary, which is really the ultimate arbiter? Uh, and looking at all the aspects you've alluded to that where it has a ripple effect, what, what can we do? What are our options? Yeah, surely. So, uh, the way the social control comes in is that, uh, it's usually perpetrated through the deep state. And the way the deep state uh, works, one of the manifestations of the deep state is that every formal constitutional institution is also mirrored by an informal institution, which is uh, more, more powerful. So one of the things that needs to be done is, uh, first of all, to dismantle those informal mirror-like, uh, institutions that have mirrored. You know that every Judicial function now has a, is mirrored some, somewhere. You even have a land uh, department that is enforcing uh, matter that is handling matters of land. You have uh, anti-corruption somewhere and other and other functionaries. So first of all, we need to dis, uh, dislodge. We need to disband those uh, uh, manifestations of the deep state. Of course, I know the question that uh, lingers in your mind is how do we do we dismantle that? But by, for instance, having again engagement such as we. Uh, having now is one way or it's uh, one in a uh, part of accumulating processes of this banding some of these informal institutions um calling them out first of all under uh, the understanding which these are how they work and uh, you know challenging their constitutional mandate of course is uh, is key then of course we need to put so much effort in building an independent legal legal profession because once you have an independent legal profession then it can be used to push at least a section of that uh, that uh uh, profession can be used to push the judiciary to the wall. Uh, Aaron alluded to the apartheid judiciary, for instance. The apartheid judiciary was under a very high level of control by the apartheid uh, government. But because there were some elements in the legal profession that asserted the independence of the legal profession that pushed, some uh, achievements were realized as a, as a result of a result of that. We need to mobilize the public to add demand for accountability like we are doing now. I agree with Aaron. It is uh, absurd that the spokesperson of the judiciary is not here, but we need more engagements of this nature to um, have the judiciary account. We need to engage in independent reviews and because when you look at the report, the performance report, and that's the way it is designed probably, it's mainly looking at uh, performance in terms of uh, administrative functionaries, but we need to go deeper than, than that and have uh, some institutions that have the expertise uh, you know, review the performance of the judiciary Against the indicators that allude to transformation, and there are several areas of uh, judicial performance that can be the subject of evaluations and independent assessments. And this needs to be publicized so that you know the judiciary knows that there are entities that are looking into its performance and demanding for accountability. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, yes. If I could just say something. So, 
Uh, there's, there's a, a friend from last night called Badru Balusas. I think he's their program director. He has just clarified that what the chief justice quoted, that report, is from 2017. So basically, the chief justice in 2024 quoted a 2017 report to give the judiciary a favorable ran- ranking of 71%. Okay. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say there's a big difference between now and 2017, but he wasn't the chief justice then, so he, he should have used figures that, you know, that give a proper picture of his tenure. Thank you for that, um, Godwin. I'm, I'm going to go to Aaron, and then maybe I, I see some people that want to ask uh, the panelists some questions. Aaron, I wanted to talk about what the Chief Justice also says about, let's, for, for a moment, just stick with even the quantitative that he focused on. The backlog, the Chief Justice uh, talked about um, how the backlog has reduced because in the year under review, they received 25,000, what? Is this 25? No, 258,000 cases. And then he shows that they disposed of 239,000 cases. But the case backlog in total, Cumulatively is about 42,588. But also when you look at, um, maybe if we look, if we have to look at the effects of case backlog and, and look at one aspect and not look at uh, the businesses that have died and, and whatever. Let's look at, at people that are on remand in prisons. So the total population of our prisons right now is about 78,000. And of those, only 41,000 are convicts. So about half of that uh, are people on remand. 37,000 people. And this is in, uh, in our congested prisons whose capacity is about 22,000, but they have about 80,000 people. What, how else could we look at case backlog as reducing if we are looking at an alarming from one aspect of the law, really a criminal mainly? Uh, having people like this, we are not looking at the aspect, like I said, of how much people are losing in businesses and, and whatever and uh, goods that are stuck. We are supposed to have also the CETA representative to, to tell us um, some of this, but we he didn't manage to make it. So yeah, please comment about that uh, in relation but, to the case backlog. No, you see, even by his own formula, that's not case backlog. I mean, we have cases you can't use a, a subtraction and come at case backlog of one year because he, he got the number of cases that he were registered in that year and subtracted the number of cases that were. That's not case backlog. But you see, <laughs> every year has a what should I call leftovers, if I may sim- simply call it. The addition of all of that, like a whole decade of cases, are there seated, and they are not captured by that statistic. Just to give you one of the problems of trying to be so statistical and clever about these things. The case backlog, they have tried, I'm sure they have done what they have done, uh, but it is still a big, big mega challenge. It cannot be reduced by the number of comparing cases you have received in one year and the cases you have uh, concluded whereby even the court where you're sitting is the least performing in terms of of, of expectation and the, 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 in terms of even, again, the statistics you're giving, if I look at the statistics of the Supreme Court. So it's not a rosy picture. It's the, the, the optimism that the Chief Justice is going is trying to project is on a shake, is, is on Sunday ground, is on Sunday ground. Uh, the people in remand are being, a, 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 being a half of what is in prisons. We know what prisons was made for and what prisons has, the, the, the numbers are far, far apart. They are far outstrip what the capacity was designed for, and that is still a big problem. But for me, I have tales of these, like, much parliament protesters, other, other, other inmates who have been there. The way they sleep is that most of those people, for example, let's talk to the matched parliament protesters. Many of them, and of course these ones are not the corrupt types who could do, buy their way into the sick bay or into better mattresses and to whatnot. So, these guys, you can't even turn. You sleep with one side of your rib and you're not going to turn. And when there was like a flu, people were getting this flu because if you hear from the your head, what is it taken a record? Uh, the, the breathing of the other as they are <laughs> God pity that room where if there is some kind of flu or some COVID or whatever. So the, the, the congestion is too much in Rosera and other prisons and it is a threat to people's health. It is a threat to people's dignity. People are not supposed to be sleeping like bundles of wood. That is a problem to their health before you get into even to justice. But of course, uh, it is a problem that the areas of Jeros are still underfunded. And on this, we agree. The, the amount of money that goes into classified expenditure that goes into the judiciary needs to be given more money. That one, I agree. They can use it better, but the judiciary needs more money, more staffing. We need more courts in more areas. 
But even with what they have, they need to do much better, even on congestion. Because why are we remanding new people, common nuisance people? Some people are even being remanded the contrary to the law for like the law requires 14 days of remand, but some people, some magistrates are even giving one month remand for some people. But the thing is that you're remanding people for petty crimes, for political, you are remanding political persecution victims, you are remanding people who are stripping naked, you are remanding people who are protesting, you are remanding people of ECOP. But actually, did you realize that the, these guys who actually steal money eh, are out and their cases will never progress too much? For them, they can easily get bail. So at the end of the day, the people we are talking about congestion, there is a class divide here. Most of the rich guys, even if they go to court, that's when they that's when they are taken to court, they easily get away with bail. Poor, poor citizen. If you are rounded out in a random soup by the security agencies and you are in a court, you may not know how to apply for bail. You probably don't have a lawyer. Those are the ones who are there. Even those with lawyers, but... Those remandees are normally on ordinary crimes. I want someone to challenge me on that. So I think that is a simple issue. I have answered any other, or we we'll move on. Yes, <laughs> let's move on. I, I think I am going to um, allow some questions, and if time allows, I'll get back to the ones I still have. But I see Michael Awoneka, there was, there was someone else, my friend Johnny Musinguzi, who was, had requested, and also I have some questions that have come to my inbox that I'll put to you on behalf of the people that um, are making the inquiries. Michael? Uh, thank you, Agza, and, uh, and all colleagues. Uh, good, uh, I think, good evening maybe to you. Yes. I have about three points to make. And the fundamental one is that judicial power is derived from the people, and it has to be exercised so. What this means is that every judicial officer in this country we have 655 judicial officers in this country for 45 million people. That's a discussion for another day. But every day when they wake up to go and sit in those courts, they must understand that. Therefore, public participation is very key in terms of how we choose the judicial officers, how the appointments are made, just like it is in Kenya. Until we deal with that, uh, making sure that there's participation of the public in the choosing of, of judicial officers, judicial independence will be far from what we want to see. Secondly, on the issue of the, um, you know, uh, the general court martial, I think one of, one of the things that I, I keep asking myself is that do we have military officers ever being detained in Luzira? If the soldiers that are supposed to be in their court martial are never taken to Luzira, but you have civilians who ideally are saying that they are supposed to be subject to the military court martial being taken to Luzira, I mean, that, that, uh, that difference alone just is actually a, a, a point to make that the system, the way it is designed, is that civilians are not supposed to be there, and I hope that the Supreme Court will be able to deal with that. Finally, I think the judiciary needs to commission its own studies, because then the issues of data, of are people happy with the service and the rest, will be sorted. It has to just commission its own studies and make sure it has data that it can rely on for planning and the rest. And um, until we deal with that, we deal with the human resource, we deal with the, the willingness of judicial officers to arise to the occasion and dispense justice beyond fear or favor. That would be very good for us practitioners and everyone in this country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, there's something I wanted to say about uh, this performance, actually, um, that the Chief Justice talked about the improvement in performance when he, you know, under his tenure, uh, and did not talk about the, the increment in the number of judicial officers as well, because... There's a time where we had about just 50, 50 judges of the high court, and now I think there are 80, and there has been planned to increase them. There have been, there's been an increase also in, um, in magisterial areas, and the judges of both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. I do not know if that comparison uh, was made. I do not think it was. But also I agree with Aaron that the judiciary is not one to whose performance you assess qua Quantitatively, I mean, when you look at timeliness, and it's a question I wanted to, to maybe also note down here for us not to forget. Uh, there's a case we we Agatha, Agatha, if you could just pause there. You okay. see, it's so wrong to say that judiciary has performed because people were appointed. Really, at what point did we get to this level of assessing judiciary? People, you get an appointment, and is that is that performance? What do we mean by performance? <laughs> That's just that. It's not performance. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, that yeah. has never been performance. Thank you. Continue. Thanks. So on, I wanted to say that on timeliness, I'd like either you or the professor to, to, to speak to it. We, we petitioned, we lodged a petition about the computer misuse, 
Amendment Act, I think you're part of it, Aaron, as well, in 2022 after it was passed. And uh, two years later, we have never had um, that the case has not been had. And we're talking about also the four, the four years that, uh, that, that the Olivia Altiers and the rest have been in jail. But also the years it has taken the Supreme Court to hear the appeal that would have saved um, many people from their rights being abused in the military courts. Yet we have cases, uh, for example, the Anti-Homosexuality Act came up and immediately there's a, a constitutional petition that was disposed of. There's also another criminal case that is right now going at a very high speed. How, how, how should these cases be prioritized um, for people who understand how ju- other judiciaries work or how they ought to work? Yes, I think Professor that... should handle Professor should okay. handle that. So, Professor, yeah, so... I'm going to let you handle that. Yeah. And, and uh, Aboneka, if, if Aboneka wanted someone to respond to his, then we'll go to the rest of the members of the audience. Yeah, I, 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 yeah sure. Prof. Prof. Kams, it's not clear that you could look at the case of Katanga, which is a criminal case, and the, the speed at which it has been handled, for instance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's, uh, it's so unfortunate that uh, cases are delaying in, uh, delaying in court. Uh, first of all, it is partly as a result of... Uh, the way the, judi- the judicial, the way the constitutional court is uh, constructed in the constitution, I think that is something that we need to review if there is an opportunity to do so, because you have the court of appeal which is also sitting as a constitutional court, but in the ordinary course of its practice, it gives priority to ordinary uh, cases that are coming to it by way by way of appeal. Contrary to what the constitution says, because the constitution says that constitutional petitions have to be given priority, but unfortunately that has not uh, happened. Agatha, when you speak of your computer misuse case uh, having uh, been filed two years ago and it has not been heard, when you compare that to cases that have sat in court for six, seven, up to ten years, Agatha, it is now like you're going to Mlago with a pimple because there are people that have suffered for ten years. For instance, one case, I don't know if you remember the work to work case, which was filed in 2011, and judgment only came out in 2021, almost ten years uh, later, which was uh, so disappointing. When you read the cases, some of the cases, you see that the judiciary itself is uh, some judges, not all the judges, some justices of the court are actually embarrassed. For instance, in that case, the VSJ case, Justice Segunda Antend expresses embarrassment and he says this is embarrassing that this petition has sat here for, 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 over, for close to 10 years. And, and at some point, the judiciary indicated to us that, yes, they were constrained because the justices are few. That's not the case now. More justices have been appointed to the court. Uh, they were constrained because they had to consider election petitions as a matter of priority. Now it's a long time since they considered the election, election petitions. And then we were assured that actually the judiciary was going to follow the principle of first in, first out, which is a basic principle. It doesn't even require somebody to go to law school to know that actually if you are facing a situation where you have so many things to consider or decisions to take, of course, first in, first out. But unfortunately, that has not, uh, has not happened. Uh, and that goes to what I said, the issue of control the issue of control, which then uh, raises the question, is the judiciary actually controlling its own docket? Is the judiciary fully in charge of what cases it hears and uh, and when? You can you can uh, just relate this to the pressure that the judiciary was put on to consider the anti-homosexuality case in 2014 and then uh, recently in 2020, 2024. So it, it's, it's really a very, very big problem. But, but I think one of the solutions, if we ever have an opportunity to review the Constitution, we should separate the Court of Appeal from the Constitutional Court. So that we no longer have uh, that excuse that the court is overloaded, it is considering election petitions and uh, and things like that. Um, for Aboneka, I agree with you, judicial appointments, unless we open it up, uh, we see the judiciary somehow doing that, but still in a very minimalist manner. Of course, they advertise the uh, positions in the judiciary, they then uh, subject people to interviews. Unfortunately, the interviews are usually behind closed doors. That shouldn't be the case because these are judicial officers, uh, persons aspiring for public office, and the public should uh, participate in the processes of elect- uh, selecting these people, which, which, which is something that other jurisdictions have done. So I agree with you on that. Agatha, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I am, I am so sorry for taking a pimple to Mlagwa. I just, I just <laughs> because I hear you, I was, I was told by, uh, so, so these protesters that came back from prison were on a space like this, telling us prison stories, and there's someone who has been on remand for 13 years. You know, for a person like that, it's, it's possible that even if they were found guilty, they would have served their term and left. So I, I didn't mean yeah. to, to bring the, a case that is really not going to the root of, of our existence, but it's what I was thinking of when I saw how fast the AHA was scheduled and, you know, and hard. And I was thinking, but for us, we, we, I, I remember being a petitioner, one of the petitioners. I've never been, you know, invited to court, but I hear you. It's, it's uh, really bad. I also wanted to, 
when you were talking about the selection of these judicial officers or their appointments, I uh, wanted to um, read out what Andrew Karamaji has sent. He says he's in a noisy place and cannot um, uh, submit. And he talks about uh, that exact point, that the judiciary we have today is not the kind that is envisaged by our constitution because we are in a situation where the entire bench from the lowest to the highest has been appointed by the same occupant of the presidency over the last 38 years, of course. And he says, under the two five-year term limit and presidential age cap arrangement, the rationale was that Uganda would have a regular change of president, one every 10 years, and this would enhance the case of tenure and, by extension, judicial independence. So we have judges that feel obliged to be of service to the interests of the sitting regime, of course, which regime people think might sit for forever, you know, considering who might come as a... And those are not Andrew's words. <laughs> but, yeah, he, he concludes by, see, by saying we see how the mutilation of the Constitution for expedient reasons spilled over into the effectiveness um, and the independence of the judiciary branch. Um, thank you, Andrew, for that. And um, I'm going to go to other people like Johnny, who is here, and Raymond in that order. Then we get back to Aaron. Johnny? Johnny, we cannot hear you. Um, I don't know. Godwin, you can't hear him either, right? Can you hear me? Uh, but I can ask a question. Ask can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'd like to thank the previous speakers. Mm. Good evening, Agatha. Good evening, Godwin. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Council Chisa Aaron and other speakers. Um, I had two things to bring up, but one has been thoroughly dealt with about how the courts prioritize cases. Um, what I want to bring out in my have we lost Johnny? I think I think we've lost. Oh, oh, Johnny, your, your, your network is, is poor. But can you hear me now? Hear you now. Yes, please. Hmm. While the issue of prioritize, prioritization in the courts has been handled, I wanted to pose a question. Are the court, are the judges and the courts aware of the perception of the courts in the ordinary population of Ugandans? That people don't think that courts actually give justice. Are they worried about that? Are they worried about the fact that a court order is virtually meaningless to an ordinary citizen? Only those who have power and money can actually consider a court order from court or a judgment from court as something that can be implemented. I, I, I wish there was someone from the judiciary here to answer that question. Do they know how bad the perceptions of them in the ordinary citizenry. Um, I hope I was clear. Yes, yes, you were. Thank you. Hello? Uh, we, we were talking about... Can, I, I don't know if you were done. Did you have another question, Johnny? Uh, no, I'm done because everything okay. else has been talked about. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Maybe they will comment on, on, on your question or ponderance, but we, we had talked about that perception when we talked about um, the confidence um, Ugandans have in courts and where the Chief Justice said it is at 71% from from a report he quoted, uh, which report we've later learned that it is a 2017 report. But um, I will let others maybe respond to that after we've heard from um, Akena, Akena Ronald, yes. I can hear back from his muted. Ronald, can you hear us? Okay, I do not think... Perhaps I can just ask a question to Professor. Okay, okay. Yeah, so there are two things to Professor Mbazira. The first is that um, the chief just seemed to say, in fact to brag, that the the judiciary um, sent as much as 6 billion 500... 2,474,300 shillings to the consolidated fund as bail money. Yeah, of course, there's provision of cash bail legally. But then the the way that came off for me, uh, especially with the recent March to Parliament and the protest against bail, uh, I mean cash bail, is is the judiciary 
not going to have this uh, uh, monkey on its back of coming out as if it is too eager to raise money for the state and therefore selling justice, uh, essentially, with that kind of attitude and the way the Chief Justice said this. And then two, um, the Chief Justice made a statement about how they they are trying to handle the issue of case backlog, and then he talked of small claims procedure, he talked of meditation, mediation, and then he mentioned the particular part of um, using plea bargaining and said um, they had as many as um, 6,408 cases that were addressed by the initiative, and of course was an increase from the previous years. But in our specific judicial system, where so many people spent so many years, spent so many years on remand, like I said earlier, someone we had, we learned recently, spent as many as 13 years, that's basically the time someone moves from primary, I think, to high school plus. So, with, with that kind of situation at, at, at play, is plea bargaining still uh, a plausible way to reduce the case backlog in Uganda? Because I imagine, if I'm going to spend 13 years in jail, and there's an option of me simply saying, I am guilty, and then I can get a lenient sentence, quote-unquote. I think I think it becomes no-brainer that most people are going to go for that. Not necessarily because they are guilty, but because they have no other choice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so, so Professor, please go ahead. We'll bring in yeah, the others later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Toko. Uh, regarding the bail money, the little I know is that uh, the way government budgeting uh, works these days is that uh, an institution prepares a budget but it also has to indicate how it is going to raise the money for that. Of course, part of the money comes from the center, but the uh, uh, institution also has to indicate how or how much it's going to raise in terms of what is called, uh, what is it called, NTR, non-tax revenue, if, I, if that's the term, yeah, it that, may that, not be the term. But, non-tax revenue. Yeah, that, yeah, non-tax revenue, NTR. So you project how much you are going to, you are going to raise. So if the judiciary or if... Uh, an institution wants to increase its budget, then it must also convince the center, the Minister of Finance, that we are actually going to raise this 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 much, which, which is unfortunate, because then it pushes that institution to do as much as it can. So th- then it becomes an, a game of economics: how much you raise and how much you how much you spend. So I don't think it is right for the judiciary to actually flag bail money as uh, one of the performance indicators. In, in any case, the reverse should be true, where the judiciary should indicate that actually it didn't raise any money from bail. Because not many people were taken to it that uh, were put in a position where they need to apply for for bail. So I agree with you. Agree with you on that. I also agree with you on the question of uh, plea bargaining. I've had my reservations. The, the judiciary flags uh, plea bargaining as one of the biggest big successes, but I have my reservations. When you speak to people that have gone through plea bargaining, most of them have simply chosen to go that route because of spending so many years waiting uh, tr- for trial in pre- uh, trial detention and they have no option but to, to plead guilty even to offenses that they, they never that they never committed i don't know whether the judiciary has actually conducted a, a study on this but maybe somebody needs to conduct a study on this uh, to trace the people that have uh, submitted to pre bargaining and then to find out how many of those actually were in a position where they, sh- they they would have been convicted because there is evidence against them and how many simply did it for the purposes of uh, getting off the hook because of uh, long periods of uh, detention. So I agree with you on that. But that is always flagged as one of the indicators of good performance. I got a young professor, Ben. Uh, he has, he has just <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I have, yeah, yes, I've met him, speaker. Professor Ben, you're welcome to the space. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, professor. Yeah, thank you very much, Agatha and the colleagues for uh, this space. Uh, I've been following your debates. Just two observations. One, as we paint the judiciary in the, in the bad light, certainly, of course, the performance has been wanting for very many years. But I think efforts should also be made to highlight the achievements and especially the judges that are doing their work very well. You see, it's like saying Makere University lecturers, sexually harassed students. And when you have a general kind of outlook of that challenge of, of sexual harassment, some of us who are not involved in that feel so bad. And the way the judiciary has been bashed over the years, it seems there are no good judges who are doing their work very well. I don't know how it can be done, but I think judges, magistrates, and other judicial officers who are doing their work in accordance with their mandate, constitutional mandate, should be identified and recognized. I don't know how it will be done. But it's very wrong for us as lawyers, whether practicing lawyers, scholars, to treat judicial officers as a homogeneous category in terms of their performance. 
We have judges like Justice Mubiru and others who do their work very effectively, killing backlog, etc. Point number two, on plea bargaining, I just wanted to provide information because I heard Professor Mbazira saying that a study needs to be conducted. Last January, or January, January of this year, a student I supervised who is a registrar, her worship Gladys Nachibule, produced an excellent dissertation amid thesis on plea bargaining and one of her major conclusions was that this plea bargaining in most instances ends up like a self-conviction on the part of uh, the accused. And she employed doctrinal legal research techniques and social research techniques where she gathered empirical data by visiting and interviewing a number of judicial officers, then the main subjects of the, of the analysis who are their choosed, and she produced a, an excellent piece of work. So the, the, the starting point is there. If the judiciary is interested, they can utilize that piece of, of work. That's just the information I want to give. Thank you, Agatha and, uh, and colleagues. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. I, I will let the panelists respond to um, some of the things you say. Um, since since the, the person in question was um, you as supervisee, we would like to, to ask how to access that thesis and maybe look at it. Thank you very much. Um, we have two only two people that have requested for for the mic. Uh, Raymond and uh, Captain Daudi, or is this Captain or what is it? Yes, so let's uh, hear from them and then we get back to the panel. Thank you, Agatha. Now, in any two-people system, you will have a leader and whoever is led, and we always blame the leader. But then, when you're talking of governance for a company like Google, you start to have structures and many people working together. Sort of, if you're riding your own Buddha Buddha, you can make 50k a day. But if you give a brother to ride on your behalf, they will bring 30k. So the reality of inefficiency of systems means that we can partially blame, blame the president, but then there is also a huge blame which goes to the actors involved in the judiciary. Now, the judiciary is not the only problem. I'm playing in private sector. It has the same problem. These institutions are very good. The laws are good. Even social media as an institution is good, we can say. But where are the actors? Because we can claim social media has bad people, they are posting bad, let's use laws, including marriage, what they are trying to push, that let's use laws to manage marriage. No. We need social action. We need numbers of people on social media doing what Agatha is doing, and then we start tilting things. So I kept thinking, what is wrong with us? And I realized when I was stuck in employment before I left, and I was like, wait, am I not the problem? We need to employ people. And we keep advising government on what to do on employing people. But I wasn't willing to quit my job and, and join this hard life. So the problem of, of, of especially Africa is we began communal like any other society. In a communal system, you expect others to do things because you have bonds of love. So you expect people to come on a protest. That's why the Mercedes would pull off what they pulled off. You can't pull it off now because we don't have such bonds, especially with technology. We are now pre-capitalist. We need to start switching to these capitalist systems very fast. And it's going to take intellectuals or the elites to move society faster into responsibility, which will be now individuals are sending and saying, I'm going to start quantum technologies to solve the problem of Wi-Fi. I can see here people struggling, you know. Well, if we have fiber around running around and people can't share it, can't I do it and solve it? Do I have to wait for government? So that's what we are not having. We are not having good not even good. People who sit down and self-transform and say, Agatha, I'm going to be to commit and do this space. Okay. That's my play. And then we have many more people doing the same in the judiciary, and then we shall have a change. I feel that it's a social crisis that is affecting everything. It's not just even the judiciary. Thank you. Yes. Um, Professor and Aaron, uh, please um, bear with me. Let's take the two more people and then get back. You can note some of the issues you would like to respond to that are coming up. So we have um, Daudi, Atatrewa, and uh, Alfred. Whoever can unmute themselves first will yeah. go first. Yeah. Yes, Hello, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you so much for for the work you do, Agatha and Toko and Spire. 
and the rest of the members. We we really appreciate the follow the discussions. Some of the issues we agree, some we we take an alternative view, but for the majority of the work you do is, is highly commendable and we appreciate you for that. On today's subject, we personally I want first thank Professor for giving us some uh, bit of history of the law. Personally I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, so his a uh, bit of historical perspectives were really helpful. Also thanks to Iron and and the other panelists. Uh for me my issue is on uh, the performance according to the Chief Justice's report, the performance of the judiciary. Well I think they've performed well in, in some in some other aspects. Many other issues. The biggest part where I feel they failed is just on these human rights and, 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 and the political cases we've had. But that only shows that the government is still holding this judiciary captive because they are able to execute their mandate properly where the government is maybe least threatened because we, you will have commercial cases being resolved, you will have land issues being resolved, you will have all these other issues being resolved. But when it comes to these, uh, political cases where the government is really interested, now the judiciary suddenly loses its, its, uh, its independence and, and all that. And it's a big shame. Secondly, I would like to, to learn from the professor for sure. It's, it's just a question to learn from the professor because I've been, I've been, uh, I've been following these issues of ours we've had with uh, the, ex- the government, with the speaker and the expenditure in parliament and, and the way they do things and the president, the way he makes appointments with the judiciary, with the electoral commission, with the way they move on. So I wanted to understand from the professor's perspective, or if there's anyone here among the people who framed the constitution, what was their intention? What did they envisage when they were giving the president this much power or parliament? What was their calculation? I'm always, hmm? I'm always, uh, I'm always wondering because every time these things happen, the oppressor, for some reason, has a way around it through the constitution. That means these guys were, what is it exactly? We would like to get the perspective of, of, of Professor Christopher on this. And, um, and I think basically that is it. Okay. So thank you thank so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, I, well, let me leave the professor to answer that. I see we have, um, one more person who has joined, um, and Professor Mbazia, I think, dropped off. So so let's, in the meantime, take the rest of the people here, Alfred and Paul, and then Kapwenza. Uh, Godwin? Oh. I am right here. Yes, uh, I have seen Professor is back. Please oh, add him as speaker yes, again. Yes, I'm So if we can't get Alfred, Paul, and then Kapwenza? Nkuwe. Yes. yes, as I announced it or said it, in Uh Greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks, Agatha. Thanks, uh, Aaron, for the good job and uh, everyone. And thanks to uh, my fellows. And there is uh, one of our comrades who poses a question uh, that uh, about how uh, Ugandans uh, perceive the judicial statistics and all stuff. Uh, well, uh, Ugandans just see the, those statistics, the judicial statistics as like, they are just, uh, spitting their satiety, you know, getting used of what they come with, they come up with, uh, for instance, uh, in case of, uh, uh, justice, uh, issues. Because the injustice everywhere, if you look at, uh, uh, the judicial decorum, I mean, the, those top, top big fishes in the judicial in uh, judicial department, we all know what they can come up with. So the injustice they have practiced all over the country is definitely speaks out. So uh, I just imagine if we don't. Uh, okay, I will pose the question to Professor: If we could have the uh, the competent entities to appoint those judiciary instead of the president, because it's like really easily to compromise them and. To me, I never seen a, a judiciary being independent since. I mean, it's quite challenging. So, Professor, will let us know if they could do any amendments regarding the, the issue. Thanks, thanks you so much, everyone, and uh, uh, greetings. Thank you so much, Agatha, for the space. I've been listening uh, since it started, and I must applaud you and. Uh, talk of organizing it and the previous speakers like Aaron, my lawyer, and uh, other professors. So it is uh, actually very absurd that there is no representative of the judiciary. I would have um, 
I would have actually liked to point out some issues or ask them questions. On what basis did they grade themselves? They were comparing themselves to what? Their performance to what? Was it a, a regional judicial performance as in East Africa, as in the African continent, as in on an international level? Because whatever they do, uh, their performance as yeah, for us as we look at it, it does not even have, it does not even pass a 10% of international uh, standard of how a judiciary uh, as, an, as an institution should perform. So it is uh, absurd that I cannot uh, pass on that question to any representative of the Ugandan judiciary. Uh, this, uh, uh, I think, in my opinion, or I can submit that, um, uh, the Chief Justice was just blowing uh, his own trumpet by giving himself 75 uh, percentage performance. He doesn't even deserve 10 percent. He should, as an educated man, as an educated person, look at how um, other uh, institutions, for example, in Europe and other uh, sober African countries, how they run the judiciary. And then he starts uh, to uh, rate himself on how he's performing. You cannot uh, give yourself 75 percent when we have, uh, when 90 percent of uh, uh, suspects or the remandees in prison, they do not even have an idea on how or um, what cases put them there. Imagine when you go to Sitaria or you go to Ruzira, um, you find, you know, the police, how they do their things. They, when a crime is committed, they, uh, the police, they arrest everyone on the uh, scene or randomly. They do not even have to first investigate. And then they take them to court and then they remand them. And that is how they spend many years on remand. And there is no investigation that is going on. Police cannot investigate. And then the judiciary, what they do, they go to prison and they ask them to plead guilty so that they can um, uh, get less sentences. Uh, if you read my book, The Savage Avenger, I wrote about that. Very many people in prison, they do not have an idea uh, about the crime that they are, they are accused of. So uh, whoever has money escapes from that wrath. Whoever doesn't have money will keep in prison. So someone who leads uh, judiciary uh, that is presiding over such, um, such nonsense, such things that do not even follow the law, and they are coming up to give themselves 75% performance, they should be ashamed. Uh, you as Agora, people who lead Agora, we should be advocating for um, international sanctions against these people because they don't know what they are doing. It is against the law. It is against the, uh, the international legal order. That is my submission. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Papenza. Um, Professor and Aaron, would you like to respond to some of this? Okay, just to say that um, uh, Professor Ben, okay, I'm supposed to use the surname, Professor Twine. Twine Mujin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, expert. Eh? <laughs> so I just want to, exp- to note that the, 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 the judiciary, the best person is to front the, the nice ideas that the judiciary have come about, the performance of the judiciary, is the judiciary itself. It's the judiciary itself. It has a duty to go to radios, to Twitter, to this idea in the judiciary that people are attacking them on social media is blackmailing us who are critical voices against the underperformance of the, of some members of the judiciary. I also want to agree with the professor uh, on the issue of homogeneity. Of course, the judiciary is not homogeneous and no society aspect of it has, is homogeneous. But, but institutions must be assessed as institutions. We can't begin and parking just individuals from institutions and say, and what we mean when we say the judiciary is underperforming is that the dominant character, the overall, we are being overall the dominant group in that judiciary. Yes, I mean, like the gentleman he has talked about, great performer. We could speak of Ngonda Tende, we could speak of, uh, I don't want to mention many names here, but there are few who we can name and say that these people are holding the torch of justice through all corners of Uganda and uh, Everyone is proud of them. What is unfortunate is that majority of them, um, I mean, majority of them are political cadres, both by recruitment and by subsequent performance. And uh, I, I wouldn't really want to dwell too much on that, but to say that the ultimate judiciary today will be judged and posterity will judge, judge it on how they failed or they did entrench rule of law in Uganda. Did, does your tenure as a judge make justice more accessible? How do you treat the lowest of strata society? How do people who are illiterate when they come to your court feel like? How do how are women treated? How are illiterates treated in your court? If we are going to talk about uh, individuals at a, an overarching level, 
what is the, how is the constitutional court, the high court, the, the supreme court, how are they handling challenges against the militarization of justice? How how what is their performance when politically charged cases come before them? When someone is on uh, is on the, his sofa set on TV, what does he see the judiciary as? That is what it is. Yes. How do someone in Chukubo interact with the judiciary? When the, the person in Chukubo wants to be in Chukubo selling things, they don't want to spend years in the court. That is, those are the things that we have to fix. The judiciary must be brought to the people rather than thinking that the judiciary is colonial and we are going somewhere to, they are not parapets, they are not churches, they are not demigods that we should be going to worship. If the language of worshiping by which we address them respectfully is a problem, we can discard it. So that judicial officers know that they are public servants. And them, they are servants, and the public are the king. That the highest office in the land is the office of the citizen, that the most important institution is the institution of the people of Uganda who fund this judiciary. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I, I wanted to say that um, in light of what, what he responded to, um, what the professor was talking about, there was a comment from Andrew Karamaji as well. Um, the issue of generalizing and us not looking at um, you know, painting the judiciary in bad light, but also highlighting achievements, especially of some judges. So Andrew says that uh, our dear Professor Ben taught us that exceptions prove the rule. Those good judges are the exceptions that prove the general rule and dim the view that Ugandans generally have of the judiciary. In fact, it is for those few good judges that Ugandans should speak out boldly because we can see what has happened to the decent independent ones. Yeah, I also wanted to say that it's possible that Professor Ben can only point out one or two, right? And, you know, I, I don't know if there's, there's this proverb in Rinyanko, that Professor Ben, uh, luckily we know it, um, I don't know how to translate it in English, which says that, um, no, 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 or something like that. So when 98% of the judges have, um, I think, conducted themselves in the manner that we have seen. It's hard to look at the 2% that is doing um, incredibly well, but we, we know about them and we commend them despite of the circumstances in which they operate. Uh, Professor Mbazira? Yes, yes, I, yes. yes okay. sure. I want to respond to yeah, the questions or the comments made by Professor Ben, as well as uh, somebody made a comment on the powers of, uh, powers of the president. Uh, Professor Ben, I agree with you that actually there are so many good uh, judges. And indeed, that, that's the position. But at the same time, when we are making reviews of this nature, we don't want to go in the video and personalize the review. Otherwise, then it becomes uh, quantitative. And then we have to say, how, how, how out of the 630 judicial officers, how many are performing well, it is, it is. But actually, when you read the jurisprudence, sometimes uh, it strikes you that uh, Uganda has some of the best legal brains in the judiciary. When you read some of the case law that has come from uh, from the courts, when you read the jurisprudence on the former when you read the jurisprudence on economic, social, and cultural rights, reproductive health, it strikes you as uh, having very committed judges, judges that understand their mandate, judges that are in position to apply international standards and, uh, you know, translate them into domestically applicable standards, judges that are able to distill what is relevant from comparative uh, case law, and judges that are able to apply the black rate of the law and apply it to practical situations, the loading, uh, loading uh, type. Indeed, there are so many decisions of, of, of that nature. But uh, what I've discovered from my research for the book that uh, I'm writing is that um, I don't know what uh, word to use, but the judiciary is both hot and cold in, in the sense that uh, on certain occasions it strikes you as a very efficient judiciary. In terms, and I'm talking about jurisprudence here, I'm not talking about administration because some of the assessments that we've had so far or the comments that we've given so far also pertain to administration. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the jurisprudence. Some cases you read and it strikes you that you know you have a very good judiciary. And then uh, down the road, you read another decision and, you know, you get disappointed and you wonder what the judges were thinking when they decided such a case. And uh, what my research has uh, come to, to, to in terms of conclusion is that the judiciary is very, very strategic. It knows in what cases to act efficiently. So the, uh, the benches know in what cases to bring out the best in them and apply the law the way it should and, uh, you know, uh, live up to what is expected of them in terms of their constitutional mandate, but they also know the no-go areas. They also know, know the no-go areas. And in my book, I detail what those no-go areas are. Ah, I, I don't want to preempt the buyers of my book, so I'm not going to give the details of what the no-go areas are. But that's the conclusion I appear to be to be coming to. So the judiciary, because it's also struggling to survive in a, a slippery environment, so they know 
what buttons to touch and which buttons not to touch. And maybe the question then is, how can we also support the judiciary? So when we write the way we do, when we do research, when we have spaces of this nature, we also try to support the judiciary. You know, we also try to create a situation where the judiciary can be, can be, can be redeemed. Somebody asked a question on the, on why the president has so many, so much power to appoint judges and, uh, several other, uh, officers. Um, this could be traced to the 1966 crisis. That's why, to me, history is, is important. Because when we got independence, the wisdom of the drafters of the 1962 constitution was that you cannot concentrate power in one place. So they dispersed power, having a federal, same federal system, but also having a Westminster model of, of government where, you know, you have a, a prime minister, but power in term, uh, lies in the entire executive, but also a very strong uh, legislature. But unfortunately, in 1966, because of uh, the political crisis we had then, Obote then abrogated the constitution. And the way he was going to silence the other centers of power was to transform himself into a strong president. And of course, this was done with the aid of a lawyer, that was Abin Isa, who then drafted the 1966 interim constitution and then later the 1967 constitution, which then moved Uganda from a Westminster model of government to a presidential, a presidential system. And unfortunately, the presidential system has uh, concentrated power in one place. And we've seen in all countries where the presidential system obtains and where power is concentrated in one place that there are so many, so many problems. That's why our uh, neighbors, the Kenyans, have been able to achieve something in their politics because in 2010, when they adopted the new constitution, they were able to deconcentrate the power and to demystify the presidency by taking away some of the powers of uh, the powers of the presidents and putting them elsewhere and creating various oversight uh, agencies and uh, oversight bodies that actually have uh, real power. For instance, we see, we've just been speaking about the appointment of judicial officers in Kenya. It is, it is a bit uh, different. And you've seen how strong the judicial officers there have been. And uh, in some cases, actually stood up to, to the executives, which is because in the appointment processes, uh, the uh, power of the president was, uh, was, uh, was reduced. So maybe in closing for me, if we ever get the opportunity of a constitutional review, this is one area, again, that we need to, to tackle to reduce the concentration of power and uh, run away from the presidential system. Agatha, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, Andres, Aaron, do you want to say something? I want to um, allow in three more people and we close. They are the only ones we have that are requesting. So if you... No, no, you no, no, no. Okay. So we have someone called Amadou Salongo and uh, Lokelo. Thank you, Agatha. Uh, my name is Amadou, and uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I would like first to thank you for this space. Uh, for the starters, I'm not uh, Ugandan, but I've lived in Uganda for about 10 years, and I've been at the center of, uh, I've been working with the judiciary most of times because I was an interpreter and also a community volunteer. I uh, had to help many people uh, who did not speak uh, English or Uganda at that time. So I was so much at the center of this and also had interest in the judiciary. Um, here also where I am, and I'm in New York, I'm also, of course doing also law, and uh, this is something of my interest. I'd like first to say uh, thank you for this, and uh, remember that the judiciary is one of uh, the pillars of the community, because this one first I'll say is uh, the referee um, between the people and the government. Uh, their role was not supposed to go on the side of the government, nor to the people, because they should regulate the community by making sure uh, those who are doing the wrong are uh, uh, taken in safe places where they will not be able to harm the community. But also they should protect the community against uh, the tough regime, uh, the arbitrary um, acts or uh, violence against the people by the government or by those who have the coercive power. Unfortunately for Uganda, I think the judiciary is not also safe to protect the people. It is one of the, cap the captives. Uh, since uh, we know the history of uh, judicial officers like uh, Ben Tiwanuka, we may think like uh, these ones also who are currently working are not safe. And I think they also fear to touch uh, certain areas uh, where they will be able to protect us. And I think maybe instead of blaming them a uh, certain way, actually the people have the obligations to liberate the judiciary. And when the judiciary will be free, then it will help the people to be free. That's why I, that's the angle I'm seeing uh, this from. Because when we look at the, uh, the place where they're talking about a uh, uh, plea bargain, plea bargain will be very well and very good to encourage. But when does it come? Here in the United States, you just don't plead guilty. Sometimes you plead guilty, and if the judge sees that uh, there is uh, uh, enough belief that you may have been forced to to, uh, to agree or to plead guilty, they will reject your plea against your will. 
and they will take you through trial to say how they can protect you. They don't want you to self-harm. But these places where people have been on remand for all these years, four years, I'm, I'm seeing my sister here, four years she has been there, and now she pleads guilty. When she pleads guilty, she wants to uh, they, they release her. But is she free after that? This self-conviction can become a problem. Does Uganda want every Ugandan who is educated, who is awake, to be a, a, an ex-convict? Then tomorrow, the UN will be overtaken by Kenyans, Rwandans, Ugandans, Congolese, because everyone is a, an ex-convict. They cannot hold a position. And then we have to get other people from outside to take those positions because we have made all of them convicts. But then, why don't you protect them by doing the right thing? How can somebody accept uh, a crime of terrorism after four years and no one has been able to bring something to to prove that they are really terrorists? And then as the judiciary, you accept their plea and write in your books that they are pleaded guilty of, of terrorism. And think the judiciary is going to become, to make Ugandans unproductive because when you convict them or you accept their self-conviction, they become convicted. That means they have limitations on what they can do. So the country is going to lose income of those people who would be able to help the country. And the same way, when they're keeping people on remand for a long time, they're affecting them in the same way because these people who are on remand were supposed to be in the community working. Other countries that are developed, actually they look for how do we keep more people free. Here, I go to courts. I work with courts here. But whenever you come, they try to see, are you active? If you're not, they help people to get jobs. They help people to, be, uh, to go to see counselors to see how they can reintegrate them as quickly as possible. And they only keep you oh, in, I'm, 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 I'm inside if it's you really not possible. Yes, I'm sorry. In the interest of time, yeah, just get yeah. that, okay. Leonard Okello, you, you could ask your question. Leonard, just in case you're speaking, your microphone is muted, so we can't hear you. And Sam, please make Agatha co-host. Uh, Mr. Leonard Okello, you have the microphone, and if you're speaking, you're muted. That means we can't hear you. You will have to unmute. Okay. So in the interest of time, I see we have just three minutes. So I'll go back to the panelists, starting with Aaron Teaser, and then wind up with Professor as Sam gives Agatha the microphone. So, Aaron. Um, we understand the circumstances in which the judiciary is operating, but we need more honesty about what are the most important things that the Ugandan public wants from the judiciary. We, um, we have to forget about uh, using wrong statistics and using wrong measures and know that uh, it is the delivery of justice. It is the delivery of fairness. It is the judiciary as a guarantor of rule of law, where ultimately that the test is. It's not in the appointments of more judges. It's not in the increase or reduction of budgets that the, for many years we shall judge the judiciary today. No. Both individual judges and the institution of the judiciary have critical roles to play, and their roles are very important because they are the difference between one person sleeping hungry and another one no eating. They are the difference between one business remaining alive, afloat, or dying. They are the difference sometimes between life and death. Quite often, they are the difference between liberty and detention. So we need a judiciary that is awake, that is energized, that is responsive to people's needs, and that is independent and struggles for its independence. Uh, it's not enough to lament for the judiciary about the disregarded court orders. What are you doing? It's a military dictatorship. You expect it to be to be hostile and inconvenient court orders. What are you judiciary doing? What leaves are you picking from Kenya, from South Africa, about how to handle difficult guys? Thank you very much. Good night. I am apologize. I'm also driving as I give these remarks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Professor Mbazira? Prof, your microphone is muted, just in case you're speaking. Uh, as we get to Godwin, I have a message that I hadn't um, relayed here. Uh, one of also uh, other professors from Makere um, was was wondering what remand is supposed to cure. Um, in prison, so she says in prison there are no rehabilitation programs for remandees because these are designed for convicts. So it doesn't even help address crime prevention to keep people on remand. What do we benefit from having Almost 40,000 people on remand. I, I, I get that to be um, the, the actual question she's asking. Um, I think we want to be able to get the parting shots from uh, Professor Mbazira. Um, but I, I wanted to say something small about what um, Shoki said. Um, has he gone off as well? I'd have liked him to respond as we conclude. He's probably in the comments. In but not a speaker. Let me check. You could, you could say it. Never. He was just here, but yeah, I, I don't see him now. So uh, I, I wanted to say... First of all, he used words, these were his words, uh, painting the judiciary in bad light. Sounded like, you know, we are deliberately going out there to paint, I mean, to 
to portray a picture of the judiciary that it is not. I do not think that is true. I think we, it's actually, it actually really is out there and obvious that we have a judiciary that is not functioning, and many people here have called it captive. Someone said a judiciary which cannot save itself, how, how will it save us? But I, I wanted to say that when we are talking about the, the, the problems with the judiciary, we are actually, we are not talking about the judges. We are talking about, one, the people that have held it captive, the people that appoint these judges, um, but also maybe the leaders of the judiciary, like the chief justice with whom we started this conversation. And I'm going to say the story of Professor Shoki. And that's why I wanted him to be here. In 2017 or 2018, when uh, Professor Nyango was, was, um, was launching his book, When Courts Do Politics. We should have uh, referenced it a lot here. It says a lot of the things we, we see happening and we find strange. So Shoki was the MC of that function. And the chief guest was the former chief justice, the immediate former chief justice. What was his name? Uh, Bat, Bat Katuere. So Bat Katuere was talking about, I think that was just after the presidential election petition. The 2016 presidential election petition was the only petition that where you had a unanimous um, um, decision, uh, everyone agreeing uh, that the that the um, the election was. It, no, I don't think they said it was free and fair, but at least all of them said that the irregularities were not uh, substantial and whatever that other qualifier is. So, so after that, this the court that was the judiciary that was then led by by Katulere faced a lot of backlash, and when he was talking at that function, he said. He said, you know, people were calling for my, um, that I should even be killed. And I was wondering, do these people think that nullifying an election is an, an end in itself? Because it doesn't make sense. And, and these are his words. I, I remember them very well. It doesn't make sense for me to nullify an election and, and say that the same electoral commission that you, you were saying did not conduct a free and fair election that was, you were saying was not competent or whatever organizes another election in, I think, 30 days. I, I, I would like for someone who remembers that, that provision to, to remind us if it is 30 or 60, there's an, an amendment to that. So he was justifying why he didn't nullify the election and saying it's not an end in itself because that, you know, there will be more problems with the next election that will be conducted in a few days. And Professor Shokoro, uh, I was uh, standing next to him, uh, said, but was that your business, you know? He didn't tell him that, but that these were his thoughts. Like, why are you talking about what was not your job? Your job was to say that this election was not free and fair, did not meet this criteria. You can leave the rest to do their job. This, this is the electoral commission. So at the end of the day, a leader of um, the of this court is going to affect, uh, and, and, you know, many others and how they view the orders from above, like we've seen in many cases, is going to affect that. The last story I'm going to share is that um, yesterday I was having a conversation with one of the senior lawyers and um, and was was talking about one of the good judges and wondering why he's not our chief justice. And and, what, and this judge, one of the speakers here, also talked about him, uh, Frederick Gunda Antende. And I showed him a story I did in 2017, I think, when uh, Owinidor was made deputy chief justice, saying that the better chief just I mean, the better DCJ, not just better, but the more qualified, the more experienced would have been either uh, Frederick Gondantende or Remy Kasule in terms of experience, in terms of how long seniority and how long they had served on, on the constitutional court. But at the end of the day, um, people are going to appoint those that they, they prefer and those that will further their interests. If we did, we don't have the speakers back or Shoki to respond to that, I'm going to end the space here and say thank you again for all of you that have tuned in. We will come back. Um, in two days with another discussion about the transition. Thank you very much. Sam, please end the space. We are done, unless you want to say something. Even Jemo Ali, she's been lost for so long time. Otherwise, thank you for the space. Okay, all right. Uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know whether you, I don't know which country you are. I don't know where we are. There's what they call neighborhood watch. Let's make it a habit. Inbox. It's not bad. It's not bad. If I can talk to anyone. Talk to at least a person. Because why would anyone disappear when you're in a group like this? At least tell us I don't have data. Tell us I'm taking a leave. 
Tell us I'm traveling. You saw the other day when I was traveling to Missouri, I announced. And so many of you followed me. I announced. So I remember a good guy telling me, drive fast, drive safe. It's a way of taking care of a brother or sister. It's called neighborhood watch. Why would we come here and then we lose someone? This is a network of protection. We are here to protect ourselves. And that's why we're here. It is a network of uh, socializing. In fact, I've followed Pichani Kola. I hope she has seen it. She can follow me. Because uh, if she's the one, sometimes she needs some counseling. Some kind of people who understand the reproductive health. We have talked about these things. So many of us here are experts in so many things. And so let somebody not come here just for the sake of we are in the struggle. There are other services that we offer. There are some other services that you can get from people who are here. Apart from the struggle, even protection. Even fast news. I remember... I'll tell you this. Somebody told me about the very community of faith. I in the U.S. and I called somebody in police. In Uganda, the person called the family. Help immediately. In Kuma, Yukutonia, we are calling and nobody can hear us. Somebody sent me that message. And I'm like, let me see what how to connect. And then when I called the police, I said, we are already aware. You see? So let's not just come here and go away. Following somebody is not a, just follow. It's for a reason. That you can go in, in time of need, and this person tells others. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. James. Naloka Jemima, unmute and talk to us. Avud Dekoba Nage. My co host, are you there? Yes, um, if you can hear me, Naloka Jamaima, you can unmute and talk to us. Jamaima, unmute and talk to us. Naloka, if you're talking to us, your mic is still muted. If you don't mind, unmute your mic and talk to us. Jamaima. <laughs> The network here is not fine. That's why I'm on and off. But Naloka, hello, can you hear me? I don't know if other people can hear Naloka, but I can't. I can't. I think the network is, is, is so poor. Yes. Um, I don't know if my co-host can hear me, but... Uh, I want to thank everyone that has taken time to attend this space. We are having a space uh, at uh, nine, uh, sorry, seven to nine uh, by Agora, and they are going to just have, be having an extension of this same discussion about the justice system and the political prisoners. So um, thank you all for sticking around, and uh, have a lovely day for God and my country. <laughs>